This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here and I always appreciate the invitation. I actually was born in San Francisco, so that's kind of neat. It's not quite like coming home because I left when I was little. But um, th this talk got set up really well. And I don't know, I'm, it was probably planned by Dr. Conti and Rapp and Riley, but the, all the discussions in the first session almost would have been better if they'd been reversed because some of the issues we're dealing with about which therapies to apply, I think we can't answer until we reframe the question. So what I want to do for the next 12 to 15 minutes is reframe the question. So these are two different patients, but the patient on the left obviously has ischemia, has multiple toe gangrene. But I think we're increasingly seeing that the disease has changed. And even though the disease has changed, our classification system for how we define the disease hasn't changed. So the patient on the right is something I don't remember seeing a lot when I was a fellow, and now it's pretty common. You get an angiogram on a patient, this was referred to by my associate, Dr. Armstrong, and you put a catheter down the popliteal and you get to the foot and there's not much there. Uh, I don't have any conflicts of interest. I gave this a similar talk in Spanish in Mexico City, so that's why that's up there. I want to acknowledge these people on here, um, and I won't go through all the names, but most of these individuals are members of the SVS um, Lower Extremity Guidelines Committee, and the several others are, are experts in limb salvage and diabetes, and we've been working on a project now for a year or two, which I'm going to outline here in the next few minutes, but I wanted to acknowledge all these individuals who participated. Now this is in German. I can read German because my mother's from Austria. You probably can't. But how many people here have actually read the original document that defined critical limb ischemia? Or how many people have read the original document from Fontan's classification? Nobody. So this is Fontan's article, who was from Alsace-Lothringen, which is on the German-French border. But this is basically the Fontan stages. And if you go back and read that article, it's really, really interesting because it was a pure ischemia model. So stage one were patients who had arterial occlusive disease but had no symptoms. Stage two were pure clotic and stage three was rest pain. And then 4A and 4B, there's this word there, brant, which is kind of a strange word because it means to burn in German, but it's also a dialect word that means to be really thirsty. So the point is when you get to end stage ischemia in a pure ischemia model, the foot is really thirsty and it's dying from lack of blood supply. And this was back in the 50s, and we sort of stuck with that model ever since, even though our patients have changed. So this article I'll get to, this is a one-page document that was written in 1982, it was a consensus document, and basically these well-known individuals got around the table and decided what critical limb ischemia was. So I'll get back to that in a minute. So we have Fontan's classifications there, and we have Rutherford. But basically, all the patients we see now that have the spectrum of critical limb ischemia fall into Rutherford 4 and 5, and some people mistakenly use Rutherford 6, and I've done this a lot for more advanced gangrene, but if you really read what Rutherford 6 is, it's unreconstructible. There's so much tissue loss, you can't save the patient. So basically, all the wounds that we treat that have some spectrum of ischemia fall into Rutherford 5. Now, when I finished my fellowship, I went and worked with Dennis Bandick. I trained with John Porter. This was a patient Dr. Bandick had debrided, had a four-foot infection, was diabetic, and he was thinking about doing a transmet. I said, well, you know, I don't think it's going to heal. And he had a nice posterior tibial better vessel with a plantar bifurcation. I did a bypass. You can see that small vessels light up great in the foot, got a transmet. Everything went fine. And so life seemed pretty simple. And I went to the Air Force, and this was the first dorsalis pedis bypass done in the Air Force on the left. And disease seemed pretty simple, long segment diabetic tibial disease, you just did a bypass down to the foot, and they healed. So let me, let me skip forward about 20 years. So I got asked to be on the International Working Group of the Diabetic Foot. And they're a really good international group that's based in Holland. And they sat down to do a syst systematic review, which was just published about a year ago. And basically the question was, all right, if you have diabetes and you have a foot wound and you have PAD, 
Does revascularization help save that foot? And if it does, which method's better, open or endo? So it seems like a pretty easy question to answer. So this was the publication. So basically, Rob Hinchcliffe from uh, the UK, from St. George, led this group up. And we looked at, we took all only papers after 1980, because we thought anything before 1980 probably was, was too old to use. And the question we asked, the inclusion criteria were the patient had to be diabetic, and I'll get to why we did that in a minute. Uh, they had to have tissue loss of some sort, an ulcer or gangrene. Um, so not rest pain only, right, because there's no wound to heal if a patient has rest pain. And then they had to have some objective documentation of PAD. And we weren't too picky. They could have an ABI, a toe pressure, or angiogram. And then the outcome had to say, did the ulcer heal? Was the leg saved? And was there a major limb amputation? So we started out with 11,000 articles, of which 865 looked like they could be reviewable. And after looking at all those, we only had 49 that could be analyzed that looked at those basic characteristics. So that's our database. And guess what? There's no prospective randomized trials, and I'll get to that in a minute because basal doesn't really work. So the questions were, you know, what factors determine amputation if you're diabetic and have a foot ulcer? Does revascularization help, and which method's better? And the problem is I don't think you can answer these questions. So there was a lot of discussion in the first session about doing a prospective randomized trial between open and endo. I don't think that's going to work. And the reason it's not going to work is because we have to define the patients better or we're not going to know what therapy to apply. So there's these lesion classification systems. There's TASC, there's Bollinger, which was used in Basel, and there's Graziani, who has a nice anatomic sit, uh, um, system, but they're lesionology. You can't look at an arteriogram and tell me what the patient needs because it all depends on the foot. It depends on a lot of things besides the angiogram. I can show you end-stage atherosclerosis in a patient with minimal symptoms, and I can show you another patient with a chip shot SFA lesion that's not going to heal his foot unless it's treated. So those classification systems, while useful once you decide the patient needs something, don't really help you classify the disease state. And Rutherford and Fontan actually aren't adequate for the diabetic foot. And then critical limb ischemia is the most abused term in the history of the universe, and I'll get to that in a minute. So let's go back to this paper. What is critical limb ischemia? Here's the original paper, one page, 1982, British Journal of Surgery. So this was just opinion, but basically if you had classic symptoms of ischemic rest pain and an ankle pressure less than 40, that most people agree that's probably critical limb ischemia. And then if you had a foot wound, uh, they said, well, we probably don't uh, need quite that low a pressure. So if your ankle pressure is less than 60, you're likely to have trouble healing that wound. But this is the part everybody left leaves out. This is a direct quote. It was generally agreed that diabetic patients have a varied clinical picture of neuropathy, ischemia, and sepsis, and these patients should be excluded. So the concept of critical limb ischemia was never meant to be applied to diabetics, and it's been mistakenly done so ever since. Now, I made this slide up. These are all patients I've treated. They're all Rutherford 5s, except possibly for the gentleman on your lower right there who had had an aortofemoral bypass graft I did five years before this happened. He got admitted to another hospital with a neurologic event, spent some time in the bed, and got massive heel necrosis. But all these patients basically fit into Rutherford 5, except he's probably a 6. This patient actually got an open bypass first that got infected, and his leg was saved by endo. All these other patients got different therapies. But these patients are different. So how are you going to study those patients? Here's the key concept. So the way our unit is set up, we have a combined unit with podiatry and vascular surgery, is based on this S-shaped curve. So if you measure perfusion, which you should do in every patient with diabetes who has a foot wound, basically you get three groups. You get people with normal perfusion, and they have an ulcer because they have loss of protective sensation, and they have a foot wound. And you have people with wounds down here that no matter how you measure it, whether you use ankle pressure, skin perfusion pressure, oxygen, toe pressure, their perfusion's really poor. So if they have much of a wound, they're probably going to need to be revascularized to heal, although some of these wounds will stay there for a long time and won't cause limb loss unless something else happens, which I'll get to in a minute. So in our practice, if the patient has, they all get sorted out by vascular surgery and podiatry first. If they have pure neuropathy and not much ischemia, then they get treated by the foot doctors. If they have mostly ischemia, they get treated by the vascular doctors. But there's a ton of patients in between here that have some degree of ischemia. And so it's turned out that in the last 15 years, diabetes has changed. Now about 50% of patients with diabetes in the foot wound 
have some element of ischemia, so they have neur neuropathy plus ischemia. About 15% is about pure ischemia, and only a small number are pure neuropathy. So what do you do with these people? Well, if they have a really small, clean wound and borderline ischemia, sometimes we'll just reconfigure their wound care and their offloading and see if they'll heal. Other times they fail that, and, but you don't necessarily have to fix every arterial lesion they have in their arterial tree. You might just have to bump them up a little bit and get them to heal. So that's the concept. So why is this slide up there? Well, three years ago I went to um, Brescia to attend a course for Dr. Graziani on below the knee tibial intervention. And I won't go into the details, but I went with George Andros and both of our wives. And this, this is a famous, right near the Pantheon, there's, there's a series of statues that um, depict the great rivers of the world represented by a god. And the reason this is up there is there's, when you think about trying to save a foot, there's something more important. You need to have flow, obviously, so blood flow is important. But you need to have architecture. You need foot. This is, foot's part of the problem. So let's, let's back up two seconds and talk about diabetes. So I live in Pima County. So what used to be called the Pima Indians, now Tohono O'odham Indians, have the highest prevalence of diabetes in the world. And it's higher than this now. It's about 80%. It's striking. And the United States now is about 12 to 15%, depending on which numbers you believe. So this slide is amazing. This is why I want to focus the discussion on diabetes. So diabetes is now diagnosed once every 17 seconds somewhere in the world. It's a real epidemic that's been ignored. And then once every 20 seconds, somewhere in the world, somebody loses a leg from diabetes. So it's kind of sinister math there. As soon as somebody gets diagnosed, somebody else is made shorter. Now, so why is this important? Well, demography is destiny because these systems that we've been using and applying incorrectly for Fontan, Rutherford, and the whole concept of CLI wasn't meant to be applied to diabetics. And yet, those are the patients we most frequently treat now with foot wounds. So how do we get back on track? Well, neuropathy is important, and this is a really important concept. The other thing that, that these classification systems have left out is infection. So if you look at what causes limb loss in most of these patients, it's a wound that then gets infected. And the thing that's been ignored is that if you have PAD, and in the Eurodial study, I'll show you the data right here, if you had infection, plus PAD, and what was PAD? ABI less than 0.8. It tripled your risk of limb loss compared to no PAD, no infection, no PAD with infection, or no infection but just PAD. So it's, it's complicated. So what do we have for systems we use now? Well, you need to look at the wound. You need to look at the blood supply. You need to see whether there's infection. Well, there's Wagner. The problem with Wagner, which lots of orthopedists use, is it has no measurement of perfusion whatsoever. And it doesn't differentiate gangrene from infection from gangrene from ischemia. So you can't really use that. Texas wound classification system is better. The problem with that is PAD is plus minus. It's ABI greater than 0.8, ABI less than 0.8. Um, Rutherford, Fontan, problem with them is they leave out infection. And they really leave out the wound classification is incomplete. So it's mostly an ischemia model. Now there is a, a Inter infectious Disease Society of America scale where they grade foot infection on a clinical basis, and that actually correlates pretty well with outcomes. So the thought is the following. Let's come up with a new system, which would be based on wound, ischemia, and foot infection, or Wi-Fi. Now, how would that work? I like to make things simple. So basically, if you look at those three um, categories, you could have none, mild to moderate, moderate to severe, or severe, pretty simple. So what's, what's the wound category? So Mike Conti and I actually worked on this a lot. We basically imported either the Pettis or the UT system, except that we wanted to look a little more in depth and figure out what's the patient going to need to heal. So a patient with ischemic rest pain only does not have a wound. So to get in that category, they would have to have the proper hemodynamic diagnosis of ischemic rest pain and the proper um, symptoms. Grade one wounds would be very small wounds with no exposed bone except maybe just a phalanx. And what we added was that clinically the most you'd have to do in this group to get them to heal would be a toe amp. So when you see the patient, if you can get them treated, that's the maximum you're going to need. For, for grade two patients, you can see what the category is here. And they might need up to and including a skin graft or a transmet. And stage three wound patients are much more complicated. They're going to need a Chopar, a Liz Frank, or some non-traditional transmet or they have a large heel ulcer, which we all know is different. 
Ischemia, basically, we just broke them up based on the uridyl data. If the ABI is over 0.8, they're not likely to need revascularization. They probably should have a toe pressure because of the problems with ABIs and diabetics. So that's the zero category. And then the highest category, which is supported by basal and uridyl and yon apoquist study, is basically a toe pressure less than 30, ABI less than 0.4. And then the other two groups in between are just split. So you say, well, what would you do? You had a patient with diabetes who has three dead toes and just got their foot infection drained and their ABI is 0.56. That's not critical limb ischemia, but if you don't revascularize them, you're probably not going to save that foot. And then this is directly imported from the Infectious Disease Society of America, but these are the beauty of this, it doesn't require a bone culture, it doesn't require an MR. They're all clinical criteria and they correlate highly with risk of limb loss. So the worst stage is a patient who has systemic sepsis or systemic signs of infection. So how do you categorize this? So Dr. Dave Armstrong and I work together a lot, so we're sitting in our office talking about these three different spheres, wound, ischemia, and infection, and looking at them like Venn diagrams. And trying, you could easily imagine a patient, for example, somebody with normal pulses but neuropathy, steps on a sharp object, gets a really bad foot infection, has gas in their foot. They're going to be at high risk to lose their leg from infection, but their wound is a puncture mark that you might not even see, and they have no ischemia. So that's, a, that's an infection-dominated um, Venn diagram circle. And then you could take a patient with pure rest pain, it's really bad, ABI is 0 0.2, toe waveforms flat, doesn't have a wound yet, have no infection, no wound, that's sort of a ischemia dominant paradigm. Then you have all these combinations in between. So we have this fellow we accepted that works with us, uh, he's actually an integrated resident that had spent two years in Leipzig with Scheinert's group and we're, he says, can I listen to this? And I said, sure, he comes in and sits down. He goes, well, don't put the circles overlapping, put them on top of each other. So we put the circles on top of each other, and then if you basically think about it, each, there's four categories in each circle, so four times four times four is 64. So you get this box of 64 possibilities. So I hear you now, you're saying, well, Mills is crazy because we had Rutherford five before, and now you've got 64 <laughs> possibilities. There's, there's no way this is ever gonna fly. So, so what we did is we queried the members I quoted at the beginning of this talk and gave credit to, uh, and asked them two questions. Take this grid, and what's the one-year risk of amputation for that limb if you just treat it with medical therapy? First question. Second question is different. If you have this scenario, what's the likelihood the patient's going to benefit or need revascularization to heal? So I actually got 12 people to do this, and I said just classify them into four groups. Low risk of amputation, very low risk, low, moderate, and high. And same thing with the ischemia. So here's what you see. As you get ischemia grade goes up this way, wound this way, foot infection this way. So for the risk of amputation, what drives it is infection, and as the ischemia gets worse and the wound gets bigger, you're much more likely to lose your leg. So here, patient without much ischemia, without much wound, not going to lose their leg unless they get infection. So as everything goes down and to the right, risk of limb loss goes up. That's the amputation risk. Now, benefit of revascularization is different because presumably most of the patients that don't have much ischemia, even if they have a big wound, um, are, are not going to lose their leg unless it gets infected. But again, as you get progressively ischemic and get to the right, you're going to be more likely to benefit from revascularization. So that includes patients that you don't think of as critical limb ischemia who have a big wound, for example, an ABI of 0.65 or 0.7. So that's the two put together. So they're slightly different. Now, the, the final thing is that group with no ischemia. Here's the other thing that we don't think about a lot. This is a patient I took care of for 18 years. When I first met him, he had a simple neuropathic ulcer that was infected. He took his toe off, he healed, he went on disability, and I thought he was kind of being a, uh, just quitting too soon. But over the next 16 years of his life, he ended up with 15 or 16 cardiac interventions, lost his other leg after a bypass, ended up on dialysis, had a failed renal transplant, and towards the end of his life, he comes in, and he still has a palpable dorsalis pedis pulse. His ABI is normal. Actually, it's not normal, it's incompressible. If he had toes to measure toe pressures on, they would have been normal because his forefoot perfusion was fine. And he's got this big heel ulcer with cellulitis on the plantar aspect of his foot. So angiogram shows his uh, posterior tibiolary was occluded. It's recanalized. So he had severe threatening ischemia, but he wouldn't have met criteria for critical limb ischemia. So we've been using this concept of indesign and green angiography, which is a vital dye that you inject, and you can see here visually that he's got almost no blood flow to his heel, even though his forefoot perfusion lights up. 
which leads to the final thing I want to cover. So this is just something to think about. This is a patient I'll present in a minute who had a non-healing heal ulcer for 15 months. This was his indocyanin green perfusion. So we worked with this indocyanin green for about six months before I got smart enough to realize we couldn't just stare at a picture. We had to have some way to quantify it. So we came up with analyzing the curve of perfusion after the contrast is injected. And this takes maybe 20 to 30 seconds. It's cleared through the liver, so you can use it in a renal failure patient. And after he had a vascular intervention, this is what happened to the slope of his perfusion, increased dramatically. So what do we do? This is the different things we've looked at. So this is the patient, lost his other leg already, walks with a prosthesis, only 61, had been treated for 15 months, including with a total contact cast, not healing. So this is his angiogram, catheter, blow knee, pop. He's got a nice anterior tibial, his forefoot perfusion's fine. Long tibia perineal trunk with two lesions, occluded posterior tibial, stenosis in his perineal. And I tried for an hour, and I could never get all the way down into his posterior tibial and back into his plantar arteries because they were occluded. So I reluctantly dilated his TP trunk, dilated his perineal artery, and when I was finished, you could see all these heel collaterals, but I was sort of unhappy. So I went to do another case, and our indocyanin green tech comes by, and this is his perfusion curve afterwards. Dramatic improvement even though it was in indirect revascularization, and the wound healed and stayed healed. So in conclusion, I think we need to think about this differently. I don't think we're going to be able to assess outcomes and relative efficacy of different interventions until we classify the disease differently. I think the disease system has to include assessment of the patient, not just the arterial lesion, and those would be how complicated is the wound, is, is infection present, um, and is there ischemia and that this system is not intended to dictate therapy. I actually envision trials where appropriate groups might be enrolled, and some patients might be treated with best medical therapy because they have small wounds and they're frail. Some patients might get stem cells for small wounds with borderline ischemia. It's much like TNM. It's kind of funny if you think if your aunt had a breast cancer and she was in Japan, you could talk to a doctor over there and be on the same page right away about what TNM classification was. And as therapies evolved, you could tell what therapy that patient might need. But if she had a diabetic foot problem, it would be really hard on the phone to figure out what that patient might need. So all this is intended to do is, is classify the disease burden. And as therapies evolve, the treatment will be different. Um, and that's all I have for this part. Thank you very much. It's been an honor to do that.